So having considered the different types of assets, equities and bonds, essentially, we come on to how do investors decide which assets to buy. Okay, and investment is a whole other area. It's a specialism of the actuarial profession, and many people spend their entire lives working in just one niche of investment. So it's a very, very specialist uh, thing. And basically, we can think of it sort of going around in this sort of circle, which is a bit like the actuarial control cycle in a way. Uh, so we think about what is investment strategy about, how they decide which assets to buy, what techniques do they use, and who are the investors. So we've got these different issues uh, to think about. So what is investment strategy about? Well, investment strategy is about balancing risk versus return. So some assets are very risky, or, but, but they expect to have a high return. Other assets um, are much more secure, but they expect to have a lower return. So for example here, government bonds are at the bottom left of this graph because they're regarded as very low risk. The British government's never defaulted on a debt. Uh, there is some contention whether Henry VIII's uh, dissolution of the monasteries counts uh, as a uh, debt default, but in, certainly in modern times, in the last few centuries, the British government has never defaulted on a debt, and therefore British government debt is considered very, very secure indeed. But for that reason, the return on it is, is generally low. Even if you uh, hold a 10-year bond, you'll probably only get 1% interest on a government bond at the moment. The next up from there is say, the AAA corporate bonds. Now, AAA means the rating agencies, remember, the Fitch, the Moody's, Standard & Poor's, have said this is a very, very secure corporate bond. Okay, We really like this company. Uh, they're very unlikely to default. They've perhaps got plenty of cash from which to make the coupon payments, so there isn't a risk of just running out of cash and not making coupon payments. Uh, perhaps the bond is a small issue relative to the overall profitability of the company. So for whatever reason, the rating agent has said this is a very secure bond. Well, if it's very secure, okay, it's a low-risk investment, so it's towards the left of the graph. Uh, and if it's a low-risk investment, the return inspectors, investors can get will be lower because they're prepared to pay more for it, and therefore the amount of return will be lower if you have to pay more for a given amount of cash flows. Then we carry on up here and we get to double B corporate bonds. Well, double B is lower security. So they typically go triple A, then double A, then single A, then triple B, then double B. Um, so double B is a much less secure bond with a much higher chance of default. So it's much riskier. It's much riskier to hold this bond. But on average, if you hold riskier assets, you expect to get a higher return. So you'd expect the return on a corporate bond to be higher or a return on the double B corporate bond to be higher than a triple A corporate bond. Okay, and then at the top uh, right of the graph is the most risky of the sort of standard a asset classes is equities. So this time you have no guarantee at all of cash flows. If the company goes bust, you get nothing. Um, also, if the, co the company goes bust but it's still got some money, then it will be the bond holders that receive the money first and the equity holders just receive what's left over. But the flip side of that is that they expect to get a higher return. Okay, when things go really well, you get a really good return from your equities. If things go really well with the AAA corporate bond, then you still just get the payments you were guaranteed. So this is really the essence of investment strategy. You compare the riskiness of the asset against the return of the asset. And different investors will have a different philosophy. So a young long-term investor looking to save over 50 years for his pension might be invested heavily in equities. Um, an insurance company that's got to pay liabilities in the very short term may be invested more in government bonds or AAA corporate bonds, that kind of thing. So depending on who you are, depending on what your attitude to risk is, will, will drive what kind of asset you tend to choose to buy. So how do they decide which assets to buy? And basically there are different uh, stakeholders, as we said, Will, will buy different classes of assets. So most of the investors delegate the decision about particular assets to fund managers. Okay, so for example, pension funds, um, insurance companies will typically employ a fund manager who will then actually do the uh, decisions about which assets to buy and which assets not to buy. So fund managers tend to specialise in particular areas. It might be UK equity, um, it might be global equity, it might be government bonds, it might be corporate bonds. Uh, sometimes they will specialise in an even more niche way, like it will be um, 
let's say growth stocks where stocks where they're paying low dividends out but they expect to grow more in the future or value stocks where they where they're getting higher levels of dividends but they're not expecting as much growth uh, some might specialize in something particularly niche like uh, insurance companies or something like that that would tend to be a hedge fund more than a fund manager uh, or a standard fund manager uh, because we tend to call them hedge funds when they do specialize in such a way Okay. A pension fund itself may use several different fund managers managing hundreds of millions each in its portfolio. So some pension funds have over 10, 20 billion pounds in them, and they might give two or 300 million uh, to each of number of fund managers to, to sort of plug together a overall investment portfolio. So each of those fund managers will be specialist in a niche area. Some hedge funds, which we say are specialist fund managers, specialise in very narrow niches where they think markets are mispriced. Okay, and, and sometimes that isn't particularly an area where you would see, see it as a standard area. They may just be looking for odd niches here and there. There's, there's one hedge fund, for example, I know that just looks for errors that banks have made in transactions. Whenever they see an error, they go and uh, trade on the other side of it and try and make money like that. Okay, so fund managers, when they're actually investing in companies, they rely heavily on the report and accounts produced by the companies they invest in. So if the company says they're more profitable than they actually are, that might push the price up because the fund managers might think that it's a more valuable company. Okay, so it's, very, it's a very important responsibility to produce these reports and accounts, and it's the job of auditors okay, to check that these accounts are correct. Auditors, the same people we came across that check the banks had got the assets they said they got, so the Ernst & Youngs, the PwCs, the Deloitte & Touche, those sorts of companies are, are, are checking the accounts of these of companies that are listed on the stock market to make sure they are doing what they say they're actually doing. So what techniques do fund managers use when they're trying to evaluate what these shares are actually worth, what these stocks and shares are actually worth? Well, there's lots of different um, types because you can spend your whole life effectively on this slide or you can spend your whole life on this if you're a fund manager this is really your whole life alpha generation but there are different areas so asset liability matching is one and asset liability matching is really all about saying we want to get the assets of the company the cash flows that are generated by the assets to match the cash flows that are produced by the liabilities so let's just look at a uh, look at that pictorially to see what we actually mean by that okay so typically a, um, so a pension fund might have liabilities that look like this going out into the future okay over about 50 years Etc. Now, different assets will produce different returns. So if you've got equities, you've basically just got cash flows that are going up like this, hopefully going up like this over this time, but they hopefully keep going up like that as well. So they're not particularly well matched. If you've got bonds, then you might have a bond that pays out these cash flows. Okay, so again, that's not particularly well matched. But the theory is that if you've got a bond that produces those cash flows, then you can get another bond which, say, produces uh, that cash flow. And another bond which produces that cash flow. Then another bond which produces that cash flow. Another one that produces that cash flow. Then another one that produces that cash flow. Another one that produces that cash flow. Another one that produces that cash flow. And in the end, you get a whole suite of bonds which produces the same cash flows uh, as, the, uh, as the liabilities in your portfolio. So the black line here is the amount of pension payments you have to actually make. Okay, so the x-axis is time and the y-axis is pension payments okay and the, the colored lines are the actual assets that are producing cash flows which are meant to match the actual pension payments so that is 
uh, one very important aspect of how we choose our investment strategy where we actually pick the assets which match the cash flows of the liabilities. And that's really what we're talking about by asset liability matching. There's, again, the whole subject is hugely more complicated than I've mentioned there, but that basically gives us, gives us the idea. The next one is diversification. And this, again, is very, very important because diversification is known as the only free lunch in the city. And it really comes down to the mathematics that, um, that if you have uh, one asset with uh, expected return equals 5% and standard deviation equals 10%, and a second asset, so this is asset one, and a second asset with expected return of 5% and a standard deviation of 10%, and the correlation of 1 and 2 is equal to 0. It's often not the case. Typically, assets are correlated. But supposing the correlation happens to be 0, then if I have a portfolio entirely of asset 1, I've got expected return 5%, expected return standard, uh, standard deviation 10%. But if I take 50% of 1, plus 50% oops, 50% of 2, then I get an expected return is equal to 5%, and I get a standard deviation is equal to 10% divided by root 2, equals about 7.1%. Okay? So, if I think about it, I could have... 5% return for 10% risk or 5% return for 10% risk or if I diversify, if I have asset 1 and asset 2, I get 5% return for 7.1% risk. Okay, And this is a, what we call a stochastic dominance. Okay, Stochastic dominance because we're getting without taking any more, without uh, losing any return at all we're getting a reduction in risk so it's just a better strategy all over whatever your particular views about asset one and asset two are it's just basically a better strategy to have a, a diversified portfolio rather than all your assets in the same uh, in the same asset or your all your investments in the same particular asset so that's why diversification matters it's just really a pure uh, consequence of the mathematics and then the other thing is alpha generation. Alpha generation is the extra performance uh, you get from buying assets that are cheap and selling them when they're too dear. It's really the whole point of the skill of a fund manager. Okay, so if you actually look in the market and you see an asset is trading at five pounds, and then you look at the accounts, you look at the sales, you look at the research and development pipeline, and you think, really, this asset is worth eight pounds. It's not worth five pounds, it's worth eight pounds. If you buy it for five pounds, and you turn out to be right, it turns out to actually be worth eight pounds, then you make three pounds profit. And that profit is pure profit, pure gain, and it's, it's not something that is a, a trade-off with risk. It is just pure gain, and that's really what you're trying to do in the fund management industry. You're trying to generate this alpha. You're trying to produce pure profit by buying things that are too cheap and selling them, hopefully, for more than they're actually worth. So who are these investors? We've decided how they do their jobs, what sort of strategies they use. So who actually are they? And basically, there are a number of different groups that uh, investors fall into. So there are life insurance companies, and they typically want bond-like assets to match liabilities. So life insurance companies will have a huge uh, pool of assets, but they'll have lots and lots of liabilities to pay out. They'll have, you know, when people die, they'll have the life insurance to pay out. When people have got pensions, they'll have the annuities to pay out. So they want assets which particularly match those liabilities. The next group we look at is high net worth individuals. Well, these people are typically people who don't have specific liabilities, so they want to take more risk. So they can aim for lots of return and prepare to take more risk. And so, so they more typically invest in equities because equities are expected to produce a higher return but in exchange for a greater amount of risk. And then the last group we look at is pension schemes. 
Uh, these are also a very big investor, and they've typically invested in his historically in equities because they were long-term investors, and the view was that uh, if the, the stock market would generally go up when uh, inflation went up and pension payments would go up when, uh, in, uh, when, the, when the economy was doing well, so equities would be a good match. For, for pension scheme liabilities but over the last 10 or 20 years the view has been that it's more like bonds so you know, as in the diagram we've just drawn okay pensions are seen more like this they're more like a known stream of cash flows and so you buy bonds because the bonds are a known stream of cash flows okay so uh, really over the last 10 or 20 years the culture has changed that pensions have been much more invested in bonds than equities And that really is a potted guide to investment. It's a very brief overview, as all the other parts of this lecture are a very brief overview. But hopefully, from what we've done, you've now got an idea of what banks are, what fund managers are, uh, what actuaries are to a certain extent, what uh, accountants do, what, um, what the Treasury and the Finance Department do in companies, uh, what the Bank of England does, what the rating agencies do, uh, and what what the Prudential Regu Regulatory Authority does, and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, you know you can do an entire degree or spend an entire lifetime in one little niche of this presentation. So uh, don't take this as the full detailed view. But hopefully, the idea of this lecture is it just gives you an idea and a context to understand what what the different parts of the financial services industry are about, what the different jobs that in, are involved are. And, and when people, you know, you hear things on the news about the stock market's done this or the pensions are in crisis for this reason, you should have some context through which to understand what's actually happening. Okay, and that's that brings to an end this e-lecture.